Good morning, church family. Please open your Bibles to the book of Psalm. My name is Ashley, and I have the honor of reading our scripture today from Psalm 8. So we'll be in Psalm 8 this morning. These words come to us recorded by human hands under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and therefore they come today as the very word of God. So let's ready our hearts to hear together the word of our Lord from Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, As Thomas mentioned earlier, my name's Jeremy Brooks, and I'm one of the pastors here, and I serve in the college ministry uh, in particular. And I'm excited to continue our summer series in the Psalms. Last week, we were in uh, Psalm 5 with Jackson, looking at, you know, how the Psalms can help us in, in troubling times. Um, but, but today's Psalm actually is a little different. It's, it's leading us to this place of praise. It's a, it's a very worshipful song, um, as, as you'll see as, as we go through it. Um, but one of the things that I love about Psalm 8 is that it shows us what going outside can teach you. Psalm 8 is essentially this meditation on, on the night sky. You see that in, in verse 3. The moon and the stars, which you have set in place. And so it could be that maybe David was outside looking up at the stars and the moon as he was penning this psalm, uh, meditating on these things. And as he considered, you know, God and the things that he made, it led him to reflect on truth about God and, and truth about himself, um, about mankind. And that ultimately seems to have led him to this place of worship and praise. You know, this isn't the only time that something like that has happened in the Bible. Actually, in Genesis 15, if you go all the way, all the way back to the beginning, uh, Abram, just a few chapters after, you know, he first met God and God came to him uh, and told him about this great plan that God had for his life. You know, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to make you a great people. And in Genesis 15, Abram's a little discouraged (laughs) because we're supposed to be this great nation and I still don't have any children. And you kind of need children to become a great nation. And we're also not getting any younger. You know, we're in the 80s, 90s. And so, God, what's going on here? (laughs) How are you going to do this? And as, as this is happening, um, in Genesis 15, 5, this is what God says to him. Do you remember what God says in the midst of this discouragement that Abram experiences? Genesis 15, 5, he essentially says, go outside. <laughs> Look at the stars. Consider these stars. Try counting them. See if you can do it. And of course, what he means by that is, how could you ever count them? They're, they're innumerable. They're, they're amazing. They're unending. How could you ever do this? It's such an amazing thing. And then God says to him, so shall your offspring be. And so God uses this moment of him looking up into the world to restore his faith, to encourage him, to paint a picture of God and his power and his might back into Abram's heart. He brought confidence back to this weak, old, barren family (laughs) by telling them to consider the heavens. And it wasn't the heavens themselves, the skies that he was really called to meditate on. It was the one who created all those stars. It was the God of the heavens that 
God had called Abram to consider again. And that lifted his heart. It helped him to see something of God's majesty. But it helped him to see something about majesty that is specific, that is particular. And this psalm does the same thing. It actually redefines for us what we think majesty is, what we think greatness is. I think that's what this passage is going to challenge us, us with today. What do you think is great? What do you think is majestic? Because what God does with Abram in that story is he shows that the majestic and glorious great God is going to magnify his greatness through the weakness of this old barren family. He's going to do something great through their weakness. And I think that is what Psalm 8 is about. And that's what it's calling us to also embrace. That we would be like David, that we would be able to praise and to worship God for his majesty because we can see how God magnifies his majestic praiseworthiness in this world. He does it a specific way. And when we see the way God magnifies himself, when we truly see his majesty, that will actually transform the way we live. It'll be different than the way of the world. So we need to look and meditate on his majesty. If you're struggling to worship God this morning, this psalm is for you. This isn't just a psalm for Christians. This is for those who are saying, okay, I don't, I don't know about this God. <laughs> this, this psalm is calling you to worship him, to see his majesty in the way that it really is. So let's meditate on the truths here. And I'm praying that God does reveal himself to you in a deeper way. So we're going to consider three things today from Psalm 8. The unique majesty of God the majesty of God in man, and then last, how do we respond to his majesty? Responding to his majesty. So first, the unique majesty of God. One thing you have to remember when you're, when you're reading a psalm is that this is poetry. <laughs> this is not just like a list of this is how you worship God rightly, you know, step-by-step -step guide to worshiping God. Though it kind of is that, um, but it's doing it in different packaging. <laughs> it's more flowery than that. It's more fun. It's, it's giving us images and pictures, and it's, it's poetry. And so it has a, a structure to it that is communicating something. That's what poetry does, right? It has these rhymes that help you understand what's this weird poem all about. And so one of the things that you need to pay attention to in poetry, and especially this psalm, is the idea of repetition. Now, some of you are, you know, these literature majors, and you're so excited right now that we're talking about repetition. And that's good. We should be excited about that, because it helps us understand this psalm. And what, what's going on is, what David repeats is the emphasis of the psalm. It's the main idea. It's the direction that the psalm is taking us. It's what this is all about. And that's on the front and the back end, verse 1 and verse 9. And then everything in between those repeated ideas is explaining what verse, and verse, what verse 1 and verse 9 are saying. It's helping us to understand and experience the main point of the psalm. So what is that direction? What is that main point? Where is this all leading? Verse 1. O Lord, our Lord... How majestic is your name in all the earth. So that's the direction that this is taking us. David is saying that the Lord, Yahweh, their God, his name is majestic. What's majestic, though? You know, is this just like a nice word? <laughs> just, just a good thing, you know, general good vibes? Or does it mean something specific? And so majestic has to do, of course, with his, with his power, and his might, but also his, his honor, his worthiness to be praised. He's saying, God, you're majestic. There's something about you that's worthy of my praise. The name, of course, is also identifying God personally. You know, God isn't just a general being. He has a name. He revealed it in Exodus 3 to Moses, Yahweh, I am. <laughs> He's the covenant God of Israel. He's the delivering God. He's the redeeming God. So when he says, oh, Lord, that's what he's thinking about. You're this God who rescued us. You're a rescuing God. 
and your personal God. But his name isn't just personally identifying him. It's also getting at who is he? You know, what's he like? What's his character? What are his ways? So, what he's saying here is that the God is a God who is majestic. So, what is so majestic about him? What makes Yahweh in particular so worthy of our honor, so worthy of praise? What is it? And I think we see what David is talking about, why he's so majestic, why God is so majestic. If you compare verse 1 and verse 2, if you look at those two together, it helps us to see. First of all, you see that David doesn't just say, oh, Yahweh, but he also says, our Lord. And so the, the second Lord there is getting at our, our sovereign ruler. He's our king. He's in charge. He's the ruler of everything. He's the ruler of all the earth is what it says, right? He goes on in verse 1, you set your glory above the heavens. And so in a kind of corny way to remember this, but, you know, God is truly out of this world. <laughs> he is greater than the greatest things of this world. His glory and his beauty exceeds that of, you know, the sweeping skies out west. And so I, when I was in college, you know, I took a trip from, from here over to the Grand Canyon, and I got the leg of the trip where I was driving through Texas, which was a solid 10 hours of just driving and sky. Uh, but the sky was amazing, and it was unending, you know? It just kept going and going. It was actually beautiful, and you could see, like, this all of a sudden giant rock formation in the distance. You're like, how did that get there? You know, it's just this glory and this beauty. Or uh, his glory also it exceeds things like the unending power and might of the ocean. You know, I went to the beach a couple weeks ago, and every time I, I go to the beach, every time I step in the ocean, I'm just like, wow, this is amazing, and this can kill me. <laughs> this can destroy me. <laughs> um, but I, I love it. I'm like, this is, this is amazing. And, you know, actually, you probably already know this, but this week is Shark Week. And uh, I actually don't just do this on Shark Week, but for some reason, I just love to watch shark videos all the time. Like, whenever I just think about it, pull up a shark video, it's like, wow, that's awesome. <laughs> that leads you down other directions. You know, you start looking up other animals, whales. Learn that the blue whale, biggest creature in the world, 95 feet long. You know, just random thing I learned this week. Anyways, those things are awesome. Those things are amazing. Those things are powerful. They're so great. And what this is saying is that God exceeds those things in greatness because he's the creator. He made it. He designed these things, these things that we wonder at, these things that we tremble over. He is the one who created it. So the first part is showing us how exalted God is. And yet, and this is the surprising and the unique thing about God, there's verse 2. Out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. So do you see what God or what David is saying here about God's majesty? God's majesty, his unique majesty is seen in that he is this exalted, sovereign ruling God who defeats his enemies through the mouths of babies, <laughs> through the mouths of infants. God defeats his strong enemies with weak things. You know, if you're around babies much, maybe you are, maybe you aren't. If you're serving in kids, you know what babies are like, or if you have kids, um, their mouths can be kind of powerful. <laughs> uh, so you know that. But babies and infants are actually, of course, the, the weakest of all humans. <laughs> They're the most vulnerable. Um, animals are totally different. You know, I was talking to somebody after the first service, and they were like, yeah, this reminds me of sea turtles. You know, sea turtles just leave their babies, and then somehow they thrive <laughs> on the beach. They just, they're okay. If we did that, there's almost zero chance that that baby would survive. You just left him out. In fact, that was a form of ancient punishment. It's a terrible thing. And so babies... Uh, are this symbol in the passage here of just the frailness and the weakness and the vulnerability <laughs> that God can use to defeat even his strong enemies. That's how God demonstrates 
His majesty. Even though He's greater than everything, even though He's greater than all, He defeats enemies through weakness. God's majesty, the uniqueness of God, is seen through weakness. And John Piper, he calls this God's peculiar majesty. And so I like that. I think that's helpful. There's a, there is a uniqueness about God. And this is so backwards for us, right? We expect God to show how great he is through displays of strength all the time. I'll praise you. I'll praise you as majestic if you can take away this pain. If you can restore this marriage now. If you can give me this job that I really want or this position or a higher pay if you can give me these things now, this, this house that I know would just make me truly happy, if you do this, then I'll say, yeah, you're majestic, you're powerful. We expect that of God because we are looking for majesty in the wrong places. We're looking for things that are weighty, things that are significant, things that fill us with glory and joy. And we feel significant when we're, of course, we're in the highest position. So if you're in charge, if you're the boss, you know, you, you feel a sense of prestige there, a sense of strength. We feel like we can conquer whatever enemy we have, whatever challenge is going on with enough money, with enough influence, with enough power. We, see that, we saw that on display just last night, as Thomas mentioned. You know, there's this power that people try to exert to get what they want. And what we need to see is that is not how God does things. That's not the way God works. So, if you're looking to God, don't uh, exert your own strength to force things to happen that you want to happen in your family, in your job, in your relationships. Don't strive for your own greatness. Don't you see how God works? See God's majesty? He works through babies. <laughs> He works through weakness. As 1 Corinthians 1.25 says, the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So, the question is, how does God actually display that kind of majesty? How does He do that? Where can we look to see Him displaying this kind of majesty through weakness? The second point here is the majesty of God in man. And we see this in verses 3 through 8. To see God's unique majesty, how he works through weakness, David says that this is on display in one particular thing that God created. God's majesty, the majestic name of God, majesty through weakness. It's on display in one thing that he made. And you know what that is? Us. <laughs> Humanity. People. When you look up at the stars, the night sky, you look out across the ocean, we should feel small, actually. That's the right response. If, it, if you've been to the Grand Canyon, this is the classic experience. You go and you look out into the giant hole, and you're like, wow, I'm tiny. <laughs> and that's right. We should recognize our weakness. We should recognize our vulnerability. Look at verses 3 and 4. When I look at your heavens... The works of your fingers, the moon, the stars which you have set in place. Who am I? <laughs> what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You know, the word for man, what is man here, is not the typical word that's used to describe humanity in the Bible. In the Old Testament, usually it's Adam. It's where we get the name Adam from. It's, it's the beginning of the Bible. And that's just general, old-fashioned man. But here... The word that's used, people think it actually means something of the weakness of humanity. What is mere man? Could be another translation there, that you are mindful of him. And so one of the beautiful truths of this psalm is that we are small and insignificant. And that's a, a hard thing, I think, for us to embrace. Uh, we're being told all the time otherwise, right? You know, em embrace your greatness. Be the center of your story. But this psalm is telling us the opposite. <laughs> actually, in light of everything that this world is and who God is, we're actually very small. Now, God, He loves people. 
And people are totally unique. People are very different than that giant blue whale I was talking about. It's 95 feet tall, long. (laughs) You know what's different about the whale and us? We are made in God's image. (laughs) We uniquely reflect God in a beautiful way. That's actually how God created us. That's what we're called to. But our lives are short. Our lives are frail. It doesn't take too many generations to go by for people to be totally forgotten. You just, I mean, there's some famous people that we know about, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, but like, you probably don't know Abraham Lincoln's neighbor. You know, like there's all these people that have lived and have died and for the most part have been forgotten. <laughs> and that's, that's a hard thing to hear, but it is true, isn't it? <laughs> Now, maybe their families keep some detailed records, and so somebody out there knows, like, all of their cousins that have ever lived. But for the most part, this is true. Um, And so what am I saying here? I'm saying that we should have this appropriate humility about ourselves. That's actually the beginning of living the way God calls us to, is we need to have an appropriate humility. That's what happens when you look out on creation. It humbles you. And that might be one of the reasons why you're struggling to worship God. If you're honest and you're like, do I really praise God? Do I really live for him? Do I really worship him? It might be that you have a too high view of yourself. What is your sense of self-importance? Where does your righteousness come from? You know, I thought about this this week. Um, When you're moved out of the center of something, where you're not the center of attention anymore, You don't have the power in in the job, in the ministry, in the position. When you're moved out of that, does it give you this sense of anxiety and nervousness? Do you think the world depends on you? (laughs) Or do you, worse, just want all the praise and the honor, and that's why you're so busy because you're doing this and that, all these different things? Can't say no because you want this glory? I can do that. (laughs) But what this psalm tells us is, no, look at the stars. (laughs) Did you put them there? No. God did. (laughs) But he loves you. (laughs) He created you. But you didn't put the stars there. God did. And actually, it is in light of our frailty, of our weakness, that we can begin to see how majestic God is. We have to embrace it. Look at verses five through eight. Just like how it says in verse two that God defeats his enemies through weak babies, the sovereign God rules his world through weak humanity. He rules it through us, weak, insignificant humans. And yet, God has given us dominion. He's put all things under our feet. He's called us to rule this world on his behalf. And so his majesty is not seen in how he rules the world through some great thing. His majesty is seen in how he rules the world through something small. (laughs) David's looking back here at, of course, Genesis 1, right? And how God blessed us to be fruitful, to multiply, to subdue the earth. And through that blessing, God has given us amazing dignity. He's given all of you incredible jobs and abilities and skills. And some of you are at you know, Georgia Tech and other schools here in Atlanta and like, can make incredible things. <laughs> you can do incredible things. You will go on to do incredible things. You build stuff. You make medicine that actually heals sickness. We've even found a way to go fly into the heavens and land on the very moon that David is meditating on (laughs) in this psalm. David would be amazed at our achievements, at what we have accomplished. (laughs) But our achievements will never be big enough to compare to the majesty and the glory of God because he's the one who made you to do those things. (laughs) We are weak. Our achievements were never meant to be about us deluding us of our greatness. Our achievements should be all about God, should point to God. They do point to God. It's whether or not we recognize that or not. Our rule over the world is meant to make us worship God as majestic, that out of his abundance, 
He would make us this way. He'd give us all these gifts and talents and resources so that we would use them for His glory and depend on Him. That's how God made us, that we would do things according to His ways. But we have all this freedom to do it, but it's according to His ways and for His glory. And that is the problem. (laughs) We have turned away from God. We've desired the praise. We have desired the glory. You know, I think that one way you could say, you know, what is sin? How do we understand sin? You can, you can see sin in this passage. All you have to do is in the first verse, take out Lord and put man or me. Oh, me, how majestic is my name. <laughs> oh, man, how majestic is your name. But you can't find the kind of majesty that you want in yourself. You can't find it in this world because it's only found in who God is. <laughs> it's only found in the God who magnifies his greatness through the weak things of the world. And you see, even if you constantly strive and you get everything that this world can give you, it will eventually run out. There's always one more achievement to get. There's always one more ladder to climb. Your strength eventually fails. <laughs> eventually, we all die. <laughs> so the kind of majesty that God has intended to be seen through humanity, through people, through us, can't be found in us. It can only be found in God himself coming and becoming a man. God had to come and live this out for us. If you want to see the majesty of God displayed in weakness, you see it in Jesus. There's no greater display of God's majesty through weakness and humanity than in Jesus Christ, the God-man, the Son of God. You know, the author of Hebrews, he actually quotes Psalm 8 in chapter 2, verses 6 through 9, but he quotes it and he's, as he's talking about Jesus. He makes it all about him. Verse 9, he says, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus. <laughs> crowned with glory and honor. Why? Because of his weakness, because of the suffering of death. But so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for us all. It's Jesus who is crowned with glory and honor and majesty because of his particular weakness to conquer the enemies. He suffered death. Jesus the fully God, fully sovereign, in control of everything, of all things. He came not as a man to conquer by the sword, not to conquer by politics, not to to leverage the fullness of God's strength and might. That's not what Jesus came and did. He came to lay down his life, to become weak, to die. He put on the weakness of humanity, the frailness, the sickness, and the shame. (laughs) And yet, in that weakness... He conquered the greatest enemy, the enemy that no one can conquer. No one has conquered death. He has given us a way for eternal life, for actually us to be remembered forever, that we would not be forgotten. (laughs) Jesus did this. He tasted death for us all, the humble king. He died your death to pay the price for your sin so that you can be free from striving, so that you can have rest from the pride that can eat away at us, that we can be free and to crown you ultimately with true honor and glory that only he deserves. This is what he offers to you. This is what he offers to us if we would trust him. So to truly see the majesty of God, you need to embrace not just your weakness, but the weakness of Christ for you, God's grace for you, which is my final point responding to God's majesty. So as you see the majesty of God in Jesus, and you realize that true greatness and glory is on display through weakness, there are three responses that I want to encourage us to consider. And if we, if we respond in this way, I think this will actually lead us to be a, a people where God's majesty is magnified among us. <laughs> 
as God was intended, as God intended for us. So the three things are, don't boast in your strength. Boast in your weakness. And the, the lastly, the most obvious one, praise God. <laughs> First, don't boast in your strength. And this is a word um, to the strong, to those who are feeling like you're in a position of strength in this life. My job is going well. I have a good family. You know, I'm young, I'm strong, you know, I have this, this strength about me. I don't feel particularly weak. What does this mean? Well, if you have a vision for God's majesty in this Psalm 8 kind of way, majesty through weakness, then it should humble you. God's majesty should humble you. You should realize that it's not your strength that impresses God. It's not even what particularly glorifies him in your life. Consider again what Paul says to the church in 1 Corinthians 1, who it seems that that church at that time was full of these people with all these talents and gifts and abilities. It says in verse 26, Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. Why? So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. So don't boast in your strength. The majesty of God is seen in you becoming weak, becoming like a servant, like Jesus. This is why Jesus says in Matthew 20, you know, verses 25 through 26, he's talking about how, you know, you know the Gentiles and how they lord it over those that they have authority. But he says, it shall not be so among you. You're not like that. You don't use your authority to lord it over people. Instead, you must become their servant. Use your strength, your power, your might to become a servant, as Jesus did. Now, honestly, this wasn't really planned exactly to be like the emphasis for serve the church, like this sermon, but I can't think of a better application as we're talking about serving one another and loving one another and giving of our time and our talents and our, our energy. Um, it's a great application of Psalm 8. It's the perfect reason for why. God is glorified and magnified in our lives as he was glorified in Jesus when we love one another, when we love and serve our families, when we love and serve our enemies. Isn't that what Jesus did? While we were yet sinners, while we were yet enemies of God, he died for us. So use your strength for the service of others. Second, boast in your weakness. So this is a word, you know, to those who are abundantly aware of your weakness. <laughs> there are times and moments where we do become more aware of that, where we become aware of our frailty, our neediness. We get sick. We have cancer. Uh, just we, we realize that we aren't made the same way as somebody else. <laughs> I can't do the things that, that so-and-so does. And the thing that you need to realize and know is that those moments are not failures, on God's part for how he made you, or even on your part. <laughs> your weaknesses are not failures. If it hasn't been abundantly clear already, <laughs> God specializes in magnifying his glory through your weakness, through your low positions. So don't hide and retreat when your weakness is on display. Instead, embrace what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 boast in your weakness. You know, he has this issue in his life and he goes to God and he says, God, take this away from me. I'm sure you've done the same thing. Lord, if you could just take this away. <laughs> and God says to him, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. So Paul says, therefore, you know what? I'll live for God then. I'll boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that Christ's power would rest on me. So ask the Lord, Lord, if you're not gonna take this weakness away, if you've made me in this particular way, put me in this position, 
then use me. Use this for your glory. And I'm confident that he will, because the Bible's full of it. We just looked at it. It's throughout Scripture. This is what God loves to do. And the last and most obvious response to the majesty of Christ is, of course, he's calling us to praise him. (laughs) He's calling us to praise. Hebrews 2, very important passage, but there's another passage that I think is really helpful for connecting Psalm 8 with Jesus, and it's Matthew 21, and it's helpful because Jesus himself quotes the psalm. He's talking to, basically, he's healing the blind, he's, he's doing these wondrous works in the lame, he's helping people to walk in the temple, and the chief priests and the scribes come to him, and they see all these wonderful things he's doing, and he sees that there's children, you know, there's these babies and infants, essentially, and they're praising Jesus. They're saying, Hosanna, son of David. And what do the scribes do? They look at Jesus, and they are indignant. They say to him, do you hear what these people are saying? Do you hear what these children are saying? He's essentially saying, stop them. They shouldn't be saying this about you. And Jesus is like, yes, they are saying these things. Haven't you read Psalm 8? (laughs) Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise so Jesus is saying, he's, he's actually quoting the Greek translation, which interprets that phrase, you have established strength to, you have prepared praise. And it fits with the psalm. The psalm's all about praising God. And Jesus is, and the scribes are saying, if they're praising you, that's like saying you're God. And Jesus says, yes, <laughs> that's right. That's why they are praising me. I am the majestic God of Psalm 8. I am worthy of praise. Don't be indignant at me. Don't be indignant at my ways. Don't be indignant at God's work in your life through your weakness. Don't turn away from that, but embrace it. Don't embrace the way of the world, leveraging our strength for our own sake. (laughs) Embrace the way of Jesus. Trust Him and praise Him as these little children did. (laughs) And that the song of our hearts may also be, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for um, this passage and for this time today to meditate on what true greatness is, on what your majesty really is. Lord, I pray you'd help us to see it. I pray you'd open up our eyes and that you would transform our lives um, to, to be lives that reflect yours. And Lord, we thank you and praise you that we could never in our own selves live up to this. We love our greatness. We love our glory. Our sin has turned us away from you, and yet you have come to pay for our sin. You have freed us from our sin. You've been raised. And so now we can have life in you. So Lord, I pray that for us today, that we would walk away from here with life in Jesus, praising his majestic name, And that as we praise him, Lord, you would transform our hearts and thus our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.